the black middle class today. And um, as uh, I've mentioned before, I think we need to go, we start off with a little bit of thought about uh, what we mean or what people have felt that the black middle class means politically. And we start off with what's generally known as the Aristotelian tradition. And it, it was updated in an enormously influential book by an American uh, political sociologist writing in the 1960s, uh, Seymour Martin Lipset. It was a book called Political Man, which basically looked at uh, the Western democracies um, and tried to work out how come they had established themselves as successful democracies. Uh, his book was very sophisticated, but basically the thrust of his argument was that increases in wealth and education um, are supportive of democracy, and the more wealth a, a society has and uh, the more it is distributed and the better educated a population then the more likely it is that they are going to be weaned away from the extremes of fascism and communism uh, and to be uh, supportive of democracy. Now, I think Lipset's work has been extremely influential. It's still widely cited today as a reference point when people are talking about democratization. And in many ways, much of the work which has gone on subsequently about democracy and development has been something of a debate with what he had to say some time ago. But then came along another extremely important book by another American social, um, social scientist, uh, Barrington Moore, on the social origins of dictatorship and democracy. And again, this was a book which drew, I think, from more varied intellectual traditions than uh, Lipset had drawn from. And uh, it, was a, it was a book which basically reviewed how it was that Germany had gone fascist, Russia had gone communist, and the likes of Britain and the United States had gone democratic. And he looked at the various class compositions through history of these various countries. And his basic argument was that the emergence of a bourgeoisie or a middle class was a necessary but not a sufficient condition for democracy. He has been much paraphrased because at one time he used the, the phrase, no bourgeoisie, no democracy. Um, and uh, some people save themselves reading through 650 pages by citing that particular phase. But again, an extremely influential book. Again, the founding of an important tradition in thinking about democracy in the middle classes. And basically, Barrington Moore's tradition was picked up by some more social scientists who uh, looked at the political role played by the middle classes um, across a, a very different array of countries than Barrington Moore had looked at. Basically, they were looking at the, uh, uh, what had happened in countries of the South, such as Latin America, which of course has had very different political institutions and political backgrounds. And of course, throughout the, certainly the, from the 1920s, um, suffered all sorts of forms of dictatorship and they looked at the role of middle classes in those contexts. And basically they said, yes, well, middle classes are shaped by their political interests and the historical situations around them. Um, and what they argued was it's often the role of the middle class is often dictated by what sort of class alliances are available to them. Is it better to go with the landed uh, the landed latifundia classes in Latin America, for instance, or align themselves with the working class to get to obtain middle class industry, uh, to, to obtain middle class objectives. So they're much more flexible. Now, how do we, uh, how do we get, how do we move on from there in thinking about what is going on in South Africa today? And basically, I've got 
three propositions which I think it's helpful to think of in terms of uh, our thinking about the black middle class. The three propositions are that the black middle, for, the black middle class was a force for democracy before 1994. The second is that the black middle class is a product of the ANC and hence remains closely aligned to it. And third, which we might say is the Lipsit argument, is the greater diversity of the black middle class is contributing to South African diversity. And I'm going to discuss these three propositions in turn uh, and to not decide which one is right, because you'll see I, 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 I don't take that a particular approach, but I suggest that both of these, uh, all of these propositions, if we think about them, throw light on the political role of the black middle class today. And I think it's worth, I want to go back to that rather complicated table which I introduced in the first lecture, I think, trying to think of the black middle class in terms of the overall class structure in South Africa, in terms of their <coughs> occupational position, and in terms of what I term the power location or limitation. What power do they wield? Is it managerial authority? Is it state authority? Is it the indirect influence of their investment capital and so on? And of course, this is graded according to uh, one's position in managerial hierarchies in the private sector or looking at um, one's position within the state and so on. Obviously, this is simplified, but it's, it's, I think it's an approach which may help us to try to work out where people's particular interests may lie. If we go to the first proposition, uh, and we're going back to some of the stuff we've talked about uh, before, again, I keep on stressing this fact that the black middle class was very, very small before 1994, although, as we saw, it grew significantly in size during the post-war period, and notably from the 1970s onward, uh, with the changing corporate structure, the upward mobility of the white middle class, the development of the educational system, and so on. Um, but the fundamental fact is the black middle class was always small, and its upward mobility was basically stunted by apartheid-style regulations, which prevented its upward mobility, which limited the amount of uh, capital it could accumulate, and so on. Um, I think we've got to remember that it was far less differentiated uh, in occupational terms than it has become after 1994. Uh, much of the middle class of the um, pre-1994 period was still based in those classical occupations of the church, the, the law, and the semi-professions of teaching and of nursing. Um, and we have seen that it, become, it has become more differentiated since 1994 with the development of middle class state employment to a, high, uh, a degree not known before 1994 in terms of black movement into managerial authority in the private sector and so on. And it was never cut off from the working class. It might have been separated in status, but it was small, it was still related through community to, work in, to, the, to the working class and in the rural areas to, peasant, to the peasantry um, because of its uh, community and family links. And, of course, it played an important leadership role in the form, not just the formation of the ANC, but in the Congress Alliance during the uh, later period. Now, of course, let us qualify this, 
because although the black middle class inside the country was quiescent during the 1960s, when, remember, the liberation movements had been suppressed and the strength of the apartheid state was at its highest, um, it was quiescent during the 1960s, but then it was to be drawn successively into more radical politics from the, from the, uh, the mid-1970s. Remember, basically, we have got the growth of the trade union movement, we've got the development of strike activity from 1973, we've got the development of trade unions, we have got the revolt of the school children uh, at Soweto from 1976 onwards. And who were the children of Soweto? Very often, they, the ones in the leadership positions were, in fact, children of the black of the emergent black middle class. And the black middle class, again, began to become more politically involved in the post-Soweto period, drawn into politics, trying to intervene on behalf of children, trying to uh, negotiate with them, and so on. It played a very key role in the United Democratic Front, which, remember, was a conglomeration of something like 600 civic associations. Um, and many people argued that it played a significantly politically moderating role, calming down some of the more extreme uh, demands of the students, trying to keep the peace, trying to stop the kids getting killed by the police and so on. However, okay, so there we have basically what I'm suggesting there is the notion of the black middle class playing broadly speaking, a politically progressive, pro-democratic uh, role, wanting to play an important role in getting rid of uh, white minority rule and bringing about the introduction of democracy. However, of course, we go back and we know that there is a strong minority tradition within the black middle class of participating in apartheid structures in the Bantustans and the urban areas. Now, again, we talked about this previously, was this through ideological commitment? Well, it was on the part of some elements, certainly. Not notably, the, those who participated directly in Bantustan politics, the Matanzimas, the Mangopas, uh, who went off to their pseudo-independences. We've got a lot of um, traditional leaders collaborating with the uh, Bantustan politicians for reasons of authority and for material gain and so on. We have got uh, the, those who, uh, business people who took over white trading positions or received loans from uh, the Bantustan Development Corporations and so on. So there was a lot of engagement in the Bantustan structures, which was controversial at the time, very controversial within black community organizations within the democratic movement generally. Or was, as it is, we look back and say, was it pragmatic? People wanting to make a living. And of course, subsequently, post-1994, I suspect when you talk to people, there is a little bit of um, uh, memory lapse in terms of the ideological commitment they might have had. But um, so I think when we're talking about the first proposition, I would basically agree with it. Yes, overall, the black middle class had, it played a progressive role pre-1994 in pressing for the lifting of apartheid and for the making of, making of a democracy. But I've got these reservations and I think that they are significant ones. Let us look at the second proposition. The black middle class as a product and a proponent of the ANC. And I put it like this here. The basic argument here is if the black middle class is heavily dependent upon the ANC party state, is it going to bite the hand that feeds it? Uh, and we talked about in the second lecture, I think it is, the way in which the ANC used key instruments of deployment, equity, uh, employment, and uh, BEE to 
develop a black middle class and black upward mobility. So in terms of my earlier uh, diagram, let us look at the position of the different components of, broadly speaking, the black middle class. Now, if we look at what, in more correct terms, what, I'm ta what I talk about as the power elite, the, and here, of course, I'm talking about the blacks who have moved into the power elite. It may be small, but it's significant. The senior state managers are very often political appointees. And when I'm talking about the senior state managers, I'm not talking simply about those in the public service per se, but I'm talking about those in very high authority in the provinces. I'm talking about those in a high position with significant managerial authority in the state economic organizations. They're very often political appointees when it comes down to it. And uh, I think that their interests very largely are likely to be very firmly engaged with the ANC party state. And the, in particular, the BE moguls, um, uh, Patrice Motsepi and so forth, and the uh, many others, Tokyo Sexuali, are going to be very dependent upon their political connections, indirect and direct with the state as it is, and in terms of fishing around for contracts. And certainly, the famous category of tendrepreneurs uh, is going to be very heavily dependent upon its political connections and the capacity to secure state contracts. And I go back to recalling the model of Africana uh, developmentalism, how important a technique that was during the, from the 1930s onwards. If we look at the upper middle class, middle state managers are dependent on pol uh, our political connections and state positions too. And I would argue that on the whole, that this, this proposition continues hold, to hold, that middle state, middle level state managers continue to be dependent upon political connections. They may well be redeployed out of their particular positions. So it probably, uh, uh, pays them to basically keep in with their political bosses, um, to hang on to their jobs in those positions, not to rock the boat. And I think this probably goes, it's, when you're looking at the low, the, those in the private sector, it may be a little bit more complicated, a little bit more ambiguous. Because let us think about it, the middle and lower corporate managers in many ways very often have tended to be the beneficiaries of ANC policies, not in the same way as the state managers, but in terms of equity employment considerations that they have been not always explicitly favoured, but in terms it's in the corporate interest to develop a cohort of black managers, so in that extent they have benefited from equity employment, although I stress that many, many if not most black appointments to any position does not want to see themselves as a, an equity employment appointment, but I think systematically we see that equity employment has worked like this. Um, but. What we also find is when we consider the views of particularly middle-level managers in the workplace, the perpetual refrain, and also in the professions, is somehow or another we don't manage to move up the chain anymore in the same rate as our, black, as, as our white counterparts do. Somehow or other we continue to face discrimination. And it's a very, very strong feeling amongst black professionals. And uh, that comes out through conversations in focus groups and so on. And you find it really across both the 
corporate sector and, the, and in the professions, within the professional organisations. For instance, if you go to the legal profession, the spats which have taken place between black lawyers and the established uh, white lawyers have been very systematic, and they're, 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 they're quite vicious, actually. Um, so I think that on the one hand, you may have this stratum, particularly in the corporate sector, saying, oh, goodness gracious, look at the latest stuff up that the ANC has made. But on the other hand, they don't feel able to abandon the ANC completely because they know that the ANC is basically behind the whole notion of black upward mobility and has put in place important policies which has aided that. So, and they continue to want ANC pressure upon the corporates and upon the professions to ease up the upward momentum of black people in the workplace and in those professions. Independent professionals, those who work independently, perhaps in jobs like IT, um, or the handful who would be in architecture, etc., may be less dependent. But um, anyway, but that's a little bit of a question mark. If we look at the lower level state managers, again, I think they're very heavily dependent upon uh, official employment. And the semi-professionals, I think, are a very interesting category because the teachers and nurses are heavily unionized. The teachers considerably more, actually, than the nurses. But they're, they're heavily unionized within the state sector, but less so within the private sector. Um, the, and within the private sector, the teachers tend to belong to different unions, not sad to. The nurses' union, Denosa, um, is less present in the private sector than it is in the public sector. Now, the, both SADTU and DENOSA, the key unions concerned for the teachers and the nurses, have stayed within COSATU. DENOSA has played a little bit of footsie with the National Union of, uh, of um, uh, NUMSA, the breakaway union, but they have stayed within COSATU and they seem to be seeing their future continuing with COSATU and the ANC alliance for the moment. But I think the important fact about this is that those within the private sector, the nurses and the teachers in the private sector, are less dependent upon the ANC and I think may well be more likely to leave the ANC fold. Uh, whether that is explicitly or just in their voting intentions uh, may be another issue. If we're looking at black small-scale business persons, they are very heavily dependent upon state contracts in both the provinces and nationally. So there is a very, very close connection between, if you like, small black business and the ANC. Although, of course, these days we have to say which bit of ANC are they in close contact with. And in fact, the, it's been quite interesting looking at the FICA bill, the Financial Intelligence, whatever it is bill, which has been referred back to Parliament by uh, President Zuma uh, fairly recently after he's been sitting upon it some time. Remember the bill is basically about trying to ratchet up uh, South African financial legislation to meet with international standards to cut down on money, money laundering, corruption and so on. And it's basically about allowing uh, the financial authorities to directly engage with politically exposed persons uh, and to search their bank balances and so on without a warrant. 
Now, this went through the necessarily parliament procedure, was referred to President Zuma, and then came into objections by the black business lobby, which said, this is going to hit us hard. And yesterday, it seems in parliament, they were saying, basically, the black business lobby was basically saying to the ANC uh, MPs on, the, uh, on that committee, saying, all of you are going to be politically exposed persons. This is going to take your rights away. So what I'm suggesting is there is a very close connection between uh, black, uh, small scale black business and at this moment, with broadly speaking, the, A the uh, Zuma faction within the ANC. Um, if there is a transition, sorry, this is a rather different point, but if the black middle class in these categories decides to move away from the ANC, what is it going to do? Is it going to simply abstain from voting, or is it actually going to migrate to another party? And realistically, it seems to be the DA or the EFF. The level of abstention in elections has increased very significantly over the years. If you look at the statistics, today we're, we're, we're still pretty good internationally in terms of participation, but about something like 89% of uh, eligible voters voted in 1994. Today, I think we're down to around just over 70%. So the, the growth of, in abstention has, it, has uh, been quite significant. Now, some of these, the abstentions would seem to overwhelmingly seem to be amongst black persons. And I think there is probably a process in movement away from the ANC by going first to saying a plague on all your houses, we're not going to vote for the ANC anymore, we're fed up with it, it's not delivered, um, before you actually migrate to another party. And those two parties are going to be the two major alternatives. Now, if we go to the third proposition. The more diverse the black middle class, the greater the political independence and the contribution to democracy. And the argument here is that the less your livelihood is dependent upon the ANC's party state, the greater the political, sorry, the greater your, the potential for the individual's political independence. If you're not directly dependent for your paycheck upon the ANC or keeping in good odour with the ANC, then it would seem more likely that you're prepared to step out of the room. And so this, what sort of uh, backing does this have? Afrobarometer, a very important um, set of surveys which looks at uh, the state of democracy across a whole range of countries in Africa, but in, uh, when looking at South Africa in 2015, it reported widening black inter-class inter differences in South Africa, and it found that the black middle class was less likely than other black respondents to have voted in 2009, or to have identified with a party, especially the ANC, and less likely to have participated in community protests. Now, this would seem to back the, divi the diversity argument, that basically a lot of the drift away, they seem to be saying, a lot of the drift away from the ANC has been amongst the black middle class. And this is the, uh, a sort of uh, refrain one is getting quite a lot in the... Uh, in, in media discussion, and it's certainly the sort of thing you hear on the uh, talk programs on the radio with a lot of people ringing in, a lot of black people ringing in, um, and uh, giving vent to their frustrations, their feelings, and their very strong criticisms of the ANC. Bob Mattis, again from the politics uh, department at UCT, who is uh, 
uh, major figure in Afrobarometer, has concluded that the black middle class is less loyal to the ANC than the other black classes. My argument with this is, I'm not uh, disputing the actual data he provides, but what Afrobarometer does not take into account is employment background and the, uh, the closeness to, a, to the party state. So I'm quite um, ambivalent about that particular finding. Again, let us go back to the how we break up the uh, black middle class politically in this particular context. I would argue that if we're looking at the power elite, that small segment of uh, the black middle class, if you like, which has moved into the very high stratosphere in our society, I would argue that the more established the black elite is, and the greater its assets, the less it's going to be dependent upon the ANC, the more likely it is going to side with the corporate sector in many of their battles uh, and in their ideological predispositions. Um, now, it's, uh, I don't have any hard data to back that, but that's my strong suspicion. The black corporate managers may similarly be placed to distance themselves from the ANC. Those who have moved significantly up the corporate structure may now well be confident in their position and are going to be probably better paid than those in the state sector and are likely to say, thanks very much, I'm doing very well. Um, I can move within the corporate sector to another position if need be. My, I am no longer dependent upon political connections whatsoever. And again, independent professionals, those within academia, the media, NGOs and so on, are they the most likely to be actively critical of the ANC? These are the people who uh, are going to be writing the columns uh, in the newspaper, slamming the ANC for the latest absurdity. They're going to be the talking heads on television and so on. Where will they go politically? Well, there's going to be a mixed bag, but again, in these sort of civil society positions, they are going to be in locations which are very often in explicit opposition to the ANC around specific issues, um, and they are not going to be directly funded by the state. They're going to be drawing their resources from elsewhere. Those within academia, I think, do have a greater independence from the state than certainly public servants, um, and again are going to be surrounded by all sorts of conversation and debate which would separate them themselves from the status quo. So I think that these people are going to be, this particular category is going to think, is likely to be the sort of middle class grouping which is most likely to distance themselves from the ANC. Where will they go politically? Will they go to the uh, DA or will they go to the EFF? Well, we'll think about that in a moment. The lower middle class unionized state employees are very likely to take part in community protests. We know this from surveys of Kasatu membership in particular. And what is very important, if we go back to the lower middle class in the state sector, the state sector in the middle at the lower levels, so uh, lower middle class uh, state employees continue to have security of employment. They're in a very different position to lower middle class employees in the private sector. In the public sector, there is still a high level of protection of employment. 
These guys are still getting their medical aid. They're, it's difficult to get rid of them. They, don't suffer, they are unlikely to suffer retrenchment. Go over to the private sector and you're going to find that these people are much more subject to the vagaries of the market. It is, they are the sort of persons, for instance, in the banking sector, who are likely to suffer the chop. The banking sector in the financial sector is, that is one sector which is undergoing continuously radical technological change all the time. And you regularly see these days items about the banks internationally and within South Africa about the banks are going to be cutting uh, so many jobs and so on. So if you're in the private sector, you're much more vulnerable to losing your, to losing your job. And so I think this gives you a different position. Does this make you more dependent on the ANC or less dependent on the ANC? It's certainly, but these people are less unionized. And I think it, it puts them in a very, very difficult position. And what their political leaning is, and this is the white collar workers we're talking about, the precarious, uh, those in precarious employment may be variously attracted to the right. Broadly speaking, the Democratic Alliance, which basically, when I talk about the right here, I'm talking about a very pro-market position on the economy, which is going to be saying, let's follow a market orientation and we'll, we'll grow the jobs and we'll have greater economic growth. Or will they move to the left with the EFF basically saying, uh, we are going for a redistributive platform. Where are these people going to go? We're not completely sure, and we need to have more information on where they're going to go and where they do go in elections. Um, I think one of the difficulties we have with this whole issue of the political orientation of the black middle class is that when it gets down to the actual electoral statistics, it's very difficult to actually work it out. A lot of our data on the black middle class in terms of political orientation is simply survey data. People going out and asking people their occupation and, say, and then linking it up to the answers they give. Of course, the, the goal, the first prize would be able to break down the voting patterns in terms of class, and that's a much more complicated issue. One has to really drill down to individual areas and then look at the proportion of, uh, for instance, black middle class people living in particular areas and so on. It can be done, but it's a very hard and tedious and let's not to say expensive uh, issue. So it's, I'm very cautious of the um, straightforward suggestion that it was the black middle class which threw the elections in the, um, uh, in the metros, for instance, in the last, in the last uh, local government elections, that it was primarily the black middle class which was responsible for uh, putting the ANC under pressure. I think significant, certainly it would seem to be that there was some black middle class disillusion, but I'm just saying I think we need to question that a little bit more. In conclusion, how do we think of the black middle class? And I would suggest actually it's what I would term a politically ambiguous class. And remember, let us go back to those three propositions, the, the, those three sets of literature which I mentioned at the beginning. The, the uh, if I can just go whiz back. Uh, where are we, where are we, where are we? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's this particular, I think, fellow, uh, writers who interest me here, I think. The political role played by the middle classes is shaped by political interests and historical situations and is often dictated by the availability of political alliances with elites or peasantries. Now, I think what we're talking about there 
is the diversity of middle classes internationally, but uh, I think we're also talking about the way in which in different countries at different times, middle classes go in different, different directions. We are all familiar with the notion of the much of the middle class and particularly the lower middle class in uh, 1920s Germany going across to the Nazi party. And that raises immediate questions about the, the proposition that a middle class is always on the side of democracy. Clearly, it, 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 that's not the case in all historical situations. So we need to look at the particular historical situation. We need to look at the particular political situation. And what we've seen, I would argue, is that the political alignments and the involvements of the black middle class in this country have actually been historically uneven. I think they've been, at different times, liberal, conservative, socialist, and radical. It has depended upon the historical moment. It has depended upon the nature of the state with which they've been opposed and so on, and it, depend, it is dependent upon the political movements they've been involved with. The black middle class has never been uniform, I don't think. I think there's a strong argument that many segments of the black middle class are unlikely at this moment to break with the ANC party state from which it has drawn great benefits and I would suggest will continue to draw great benefits. There may be a great fear of leaving the ANC despite the very considerable high level of dissatisfaction amongst the black middle class about ANC performance. But it's a big step to actually leaving the ANC. It's a big step from simply not participating in voting to moving to another party. And that seems to be a real dilemma for many black middle class people. Moving to the DA is seen to be quite a big step, although, of course, with a black leadership these days and uh, the, whatever example the DA may set in running more cities, perhaps that, though, that position will be eroded. But I think this last item that the uh, the more the BMC, the black middle class, participates in civil society and expresses disillusion with the ANC, the more it may challenge political authoritarianism and corruption. And I think this is the Lipset type argument. It also merges with the um, Barrington Moore type argument. And I think it really points to the importance of the potential role of the black middle class in this country in challenging authorities, wherever they may be, of whatever party they are, in terms of their uh, conduct in running the state, in terms of challenging corruption, in terms of, of challenging established interests, and in terms of arguing for greater freedoms, um, liberality, and so on. But I think we always have to recognize this political ambiguity, and I don't think there is one firm political position that the black middle class as a class takes. The black middle class is segmented, and those different segments will be looking in different political directions in terms of their political orientations and their political activities. And that's the sort of, um, that is the, uh, I think, rather uh, uh, complicated argument that I'm putting to you, and I'm just going to throw the whole thing out for debate now, just for questions and discussion. Black middle class people to identify with two different sections of the 
Yes, of course, if the ANC splits, um, that's going to uh, put the cat amongst the pigeons, clearly. Um, but I think that in, if that were to happen, and I'm not so sure it will, if that were to happen, then I think my distinction between the uh, closeness in terms of state employment and in terms of the independence from state employment might well be a useful factor in trying to work out where the black middle class might go. But clearly what we're seeing at the moment is, which you're pointing to, is at many levels there, there is not just one A and C at the moment. Yeah. And that is, that is sort of works both ways, doesn't it? Because are you going to be backing the Zoom a lot or are you going to be backing the Pravin lot? Um, how does that mean you're going to vote? What is it, how does it play out in terms of the leadership contest? Um, and what happens in the, ne in the next election. But I think we do have to be very wary of thinking that simply the next election, the ANC is going to be wiped out. We know that the ANC has got a very formidable um, electoral machinery, even though it's looking pretty ramshackle at the moment. But um, anyway, yes. Uh, it's, it's in connection with what you've just been saying, uh, we attended a lecture here uh, from somebody from the politics department their prediction, or his prediction, is that the, 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 the Congress, the elective Congress, is going to be a very tight battle, like similar to the Zuma and Becky battle. And that, that should uh, the traditional lists win, then the Ramaphosa uh, um, and the, especially the Gauteng uh, ANC people might split off, off him. Uh, on the other hand, if, if they win, Ramaphosa win, and the traditionalists might go, you know, also split. And that's the scenario is what he was pointing to. Who was that? Is interesting. Um, no, no, um, no it's mind. Based on, um, he gave a lecture to us. It's, it's based on on, on the, um, the previous, um, this nice, 2006. Okay. So um, he's saying, in that case, he's saying that there might be coalitions between uh, Cyril and, and, and EFF and, and DA on the one side, and other coalitions on, 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 on Zuma's side. Yeah, well, I mean, yes, it's, it's very difficult to read into the crystal balls, isn't it? I mean, traditionally, the, uh, the, the uh, thesis, which was very prominent for quite a long time, was that one day the, uh, the, the ANC and the South African Communist Party would break, and that there would be a division basically between the socialists and the nationalists, as, it, as the terminology was used. But that seemed to suggest that the ANC was much more coherent than it is today. And certainly the level of fragmentation today is very high. It revolves around this issue whether the ANC proves capable of reforming itself, and at the moment, frankly, it doesn't seem to be able to. But I think that, again, if we're looking at the ANC, why is it proving so difficult to actually um, think seriously about this whole issue of reforming its structures? And it's because of the battle for power and position and access to state resources. And that's where the factional struggle is, seems to be um, breaking down. And those who want to defend the relative independence of the state and the treasury and so on. Is the black middle class going to split? If it's, if it's going to split in the terms of if there was to be a split, I think the black middle class is going to be going in different directions. I don't think it's just going to go one way. That's my basic argument uh, from this sort of position. Uh, we've just been talking about the Zuma Ramaphosa sides of things. Now, a little earlier on, a few minutes ago, you chose to say Zuma and Pravin. Uh, what made you choose Pravin instead of Ramaphosa? <laughs> two sides. No, no, I wasn't, uh, no, I wasn't um, uh, trying to distinguish between Pravin and uh, Ramaphosa. I was really referring to the battles around the Treasury. That was what came into my head. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, uh, well, is Cyril going to get it? Well, the argument is he's got to fight for it. And is he a fighter? We don't know.
They're not central. Yeah. No, I don't think they are. Not in the sense of actual votes, yeah. but in terms of influence, they may well be, that may be significantly different. Yeah. In terms of the talking heads on television, in terms of the columns, in terms of influence within communities, I think that is, uh, that may be a different issue. In terms of the if you like, the tendrepreneur section, in terms of the people they employ, in terms of their influence within their communities, com continuing to say that uh, we are very dependent upon receipt of state goodies, um, that's also going to play, play out. So um, I think the interesting thing is, and I'd be interested to know what people's uh, views here, is the extent to which the black middle class will move into the DA and play a significant role there. I'm not sufficiently close to the DA to know exactly what's going on there, but uh, clearly the, I mean, this is what uh, uh, Maimani is hanging a lot of hopes on there um, and sort of trying to attract independent elements of the um, uh, of the black middle class into the DA. If he's going to do that, he's going to have to overcome this sort of historical social psych psychological barrier, which I've mentioned before, the way in which many uh, black middle class people say, I come from an ANC background, I come from an ANC family, I'm fed up with the ANC, but somehow I can't I can't completely make the break. Um, so that's, can he take advantage of that? Can he actually manage to do that? Sorry, the, the, the ideological commitment. Well, I think so, yes, but I think it's, it's not just ideology, you see. That's the interesting thing. When um, certainly it came out in focus groups uh, I conducted, it's not just ideology. There, there's a lot of people saying out there, I'm fed up with the ANC, absolutely fed up to the teeth with them. But it's, it's here. It's in the gut. Yeah, yeah. Um, what happens with the second generation, the younger black middle class kids, I suspect it's going to be a lot easier to move away from the ANC. These guys, I mean, they're, they're you know, the so-called freeborn, uh, born freeze, not freeborns, born freeze. Um, they're probably fed up with here, you know, stories of the struggle around the breakfast table. Um, they're involved with, some of them involved with the fees must fall, they're fed up with all sorts of authority. Whether they will direct their energies into conventional party politics, of course, is another issue. But uh, I would suggest that they're much more likely. It must be this second generation black middle class which may be much more prepared to break away from the sort of um, uh, hypotheses I've been putting up and the dependence upon the state employment. Yes, sir. I thoroughly enjoyed your lectures. Taking up on what you just said, I would have perhaps enjoyed some black sitting at the lectures to get a comment, black comment, not necessarily to disagree with you, but we have heard white comment. Yeah. Only white from a variety of different speakers. I would have enjoyed perhaps to have heard uh, yeah. comment, not all the time, but perhaps as a summary of what you have been saying. Well, I can only agree with you. Um, uh, the, uh, yeah, I can only agree with you. I think it's very important that, as I sort of indicated right at the beginning, the danger of talking about the black middle class as if they're exotic <coughs> stereotypes, as if they're some sort of zoological animal. I'm a, fully aware of the danger of that, and it's very important for the black middle class people themselves to be talking about this issue. And um, uh, I've certainly come across this sort of issue before. People have put it to me, as I, I think I mentioned, what right have you got to be talking about the black middle class? It should be us talking about it. Yes, I agree with that. But 
I've also got a right to talk about it, and I think it's important that we all think about it. Indeed. But, uh, perhaps you've got some second-generation students, black students, who could sit in and ask comment. And, uh, I'd enjoy their party. Well, it would be a fair... I think that would have been a nice idea, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> if I do this again, I'll think of it, certainly, yeah. If this, can I ask another question? Uh, the EFF is, is really the, a breakaway ANC UP. Uh, and people like um, Julius Malema and Floyd, they are really in the black middle class. What kind of support have they got in the black middle class? Uh, I don't think they've got too much, but they've got some quite vocal support amongst the black middle class. Those who go to them... Uh, are likely to be very supposedly politically radical and they're likely to be very vocal. So certainly those um, sort of persons are going to be quite prominent within the EFF. But the EFF's fundamental constituency is amongst the, basically, the very poor and the unemployed. Yeah. Sorry, there's, there's, can I take this gentleman first? I think there's a reluctance I think you're probably right, um, to some extent. I think the, uh, the crowd, the talking heads, would be quite prepared to, to uh, talk about it quite openly. But I think there is this, certainly, reluctance to show your cards politically. I think that um, there's quite a lot of sentiment around the f fact that, uh, in terms of the last local government elections, is that you don't announce to people you're going to vote DA but you go along to the booth and you vote DAA yeah. and keep quiet about it. But the more that people, the more that black people will say, I'm going to vote DA, then the more perhaps the ball gets rolling Maybe and it's more themselves. diverse. So Maybe that's... It themselves, but I, I, I don't see them wanting to debate. So I think it's still, I, I suspect there's still a reluctance amongst many black people to actually stand up and say, I'm going to vote for the DA. We've got a problem, we've got the historical problem there in terms of our party system. And what I'm, so I'm not suggesting that everybody should go and vote DA, I've never had anything to do with DA in my life. But what I'm saying is it's very good to have a, a politically diverse system, and so it's important to think of how we break up the monolithic uh, voting patterns for the ANC. The gentleman here. It is a shame, of course, that we don't have any blacks here to give their opinions, but what contact do you have with the black You're talking about me personally, or are you talking? Oh, well, I think I've come from a very advantaged situation in working at, uh, having been working at Wits University, where the, I think the, uh, I, loved I loved working at Wits, quite frankly. Um, it's extremely diverse, particularly in the social sciences. Um, I used to say of the sociology departments, it's made up of all sorts of na nationalities, shapes and sizes of people. It was extremely diverse, and I think within the academic community, um, there, are, there are, certainly Vitz has got a lot of black scholars, and of course the mass of our students, and particularly at postgraduate level, um, are, are black, although many of them, of course, come from Zimbabwe these days and so on. But I suppose it's within academia that basically I've had daily contact with black middle class people. Much more difficult outside, which is the why one goes to sort of fairly artificial things like focus groups, which um, I had never used focus groups before I wrote this book, but, um, and I was always fairly skeptical of them, but actually I found them quite, quite interesting and revealing. But you need that time to, but you need to get into the conversation. You can't start off uh, this sort of conversation and say, who are you going to vote for? You have to sort of get the discussion going and let people unwind and sort of let them say all sorts of things which they wouldn't normally say uh, outside their own grouping. <laughs>